Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that's coming up later this week. I'm not, can't say I'm really looking forward to the shoulder surgery, but my third time, so I know what it looks like. Well, I thought the surgery was going to be mid-December, and I was, that was, seemed fine, but when I went back for my pre-op, I found that my surgery wasn't going to be till almost the end of January. And so I was having my meeting with my surgeon. <laughs> I mean, he's done three surgeries on me, so he's my friend now. Um, I've helped support his life significantly, and <laughs> I, really, I really like him. But when I found out I wasn't going to have surgery till later in January, I said, I just asked him, I said, well, you know, I've really kind of gotten back into skiing, and so since the surgery is not going to be till the end of January, what do you think about me skiing before the surgery? And he kind of didn't say much, and he said, well... <laughs> It's not actually the skiing that's going to hurt you. He said, it's the falling. If you fall, you could actually... I said, you know, I try not to fall. He said, everyone tries not to fall. <laughs> I don't fall that much, but I do occasionally fall. But he said, you know, he said, well, I, you know, I, I don't know. He said, well, it's, you, it's up to you, I guess, but we'll fix what we can fix when we get in there. And so when I came home, I, Charlotte asked if I talked to him about skiing, and I said, he essentially insisted that I ski before the surgery. <laughs> Charlotte's been such a good sport about the skiing, but uh, so I wasn't sure, like, should I give it a shot? Should I not give it a shot? I don't know. I was, but then I ended up going to C uh, Seattle area last week or the week before. I can't remember. It was, must have been not last week, but the week before that. And uh, on my way back, uh, I just was coming over Stevens Pass. I happened to be coming over Stevens Pass, and it turned out that I had my skis and stuff in the car. I have these passes, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do with these passes if I don't ski? And I'm having a little bit of trouble getting them refunded, so I thought, well, it's, it was night. So I thought, I haven't been night skiing in a while, so I decided to go skiing, and it was really, really fun. But I did have a slight mishap. I was going past this old fellow, and I kind of twisted, and when I twisted, my skis got crossed up, and I plowed straight into the ground on my right shoulder. It was just horrible. It was like the pain was unbearable, and, and it actually did just... De I couldn't even get myself out of the skis because I, I had no zero strength in my arm. Like, I couldn't actually move it from the, the, the kind of the elbow rest between the seats to shift at that point. It's kind of gotten a little better now, but, um, but anyway, it was just, it was like, and I'm laying there in that moment thinking, I've got to make better decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I got up, and I only did more, one more run after that, and I fell on the mountain again. Now, the thing that I haven't exactly said to everyone about this little accident is that I was actually in this, the lift line. This is where I fall. I don't fall very often on the mountain, but if I do fall, it's on the lift line. And here I am going on the lift line, and, and now they have cards. It's like the mark of the beast, right? The card's in your, in, your, in, your, in your sleeve, and they just wave the scanner until they find it. And I was going by this guy, and I was kind of moving, and, and, and he was trying to find my card and I was I had my arm out because it's right here in this little pocket in my in my ski jacket and I'm going by and I get past him and he still hasn't found it and so I'm turning to try to give him my arm and in doing that I got my skis twisted and crossed and I just plowed into the ground in the only place on the mountain where it's hard which is in, on the ski lift line and if I fall it's there because it's you know it's nice for people to be able to and they're just going by me I'm on like I'm like like a, I'm like a turtle on my back. I can't, I don't, I can't get my skis off because I'm laying on one and this arm is now zero strength and I'm, I'm pushing with my pole to try to release. I can't get it off. I'm just laying there and people are just going by me. The lifty guy, he's standing over there. I don't even know. Suddenly he turns around and goes, what happened to you? <laughs> it's like, dude, I fell and, and I can't get my ski off because I, I have no strength in my arm. He's like, well, well do you want me to kick it off? It's at this point, you know, you want to go like, well, what else do you think we can do here? I mean, I don't know. You could call, I guess you could call an ambulance. I don't know. But so he's like, okay, I'll kick it. So he kicks my ski off and then he walks away. Well, I'm still laying on the other ski. I still can't get up. And he's like, people are going by me and people are going by me. And I'm just like, you know, just trying to figure out how to get off the ground. And, and he turns around again. I don't know if something like a half hour went by. No, it wasn't. But it was, it seemed like it. He turns around and goes, you're still there. I'm like, I have, I'm like I told him, he's like, dude, I cannot do, I have no strength in my arm and I can't move. I can't get up. So he's like, do you want me to kick your other ski off? Yes. I'm not sure. I mean, this is like when your kids are cleaning the room, um, you know, clean the, clean the living room, you know, clean up the living room. Okay, take that, put those shoes away. Yeah, now that ball, put that away. Now that hat, yeah, put that away. You know, that kind of thing. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, he, 
Finally, he kicks my other ski off, and I wrestle myself up. Now I'm in the lift line, so I'm not, you know, I'm not quitting now. I put my skis back on, and I went to the top of the mountain. I'm a little frustrated with my skiing because I'm trying to get back into it, and it's, I'm really enjoying it, but I, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I, one of my runs when I was coming down Stevens, I, was, I went by this guy, and, and <laughs> I went by him, and, and he yells at me, keep your hips quiet. I don't even know what that means. Like, I mean, what? I'm just like, I'm just trying to get down the mountain here. But it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a really fun sport, but it's really important that you keep yourself aligned, right? You, your skis have to be not crossed. You know, you got to be, you got to keep that, all that stuff in alignment. And proper alignment is like, it, it matters for almost everything. If your car's out of alignment, it's going to cause trouble. If your back's out of alignment, it's going to cause trouble. If your body's not in, in good shape, it's going to be difficult to, to get along. And so alignment matters in so much of our life. And as we've been thinking about this topic of sowing and reaping, the question on, on my mind today and that I want to put, put to you is, how, how's your alignment with the kingdom? Like, how is your life lining up with kingdom principles? Are you aligned with the kingdom in, in, in the life that you're living? And I think that it's really important for us to keep our lives in alignment with kingdom principles. I think it's really going to be important this year. You know, as we come into this political season, I think we forget sometimes that our, our first alignment has to be with the kingdom of God. That's got to be our first, uh, that's our first commitment. That's our, our first, um, that's the first thing we're allied to. That our allegiance has got to be to the kingdom. And I want to challenge you as we walk into this political season to make sure before you align yourself with liberals or conservatives, Republicans or uh, Democrats or independents, or before you align yourself with any political party or ideology, I want to challenge you to align yourself with the kingdom and make sure that's what drives you through this season. That's what carries you through the season in your conversations, in, in all of your interactions, whether it's online or it's in person. Let's just remember that we, we first align ourselves with the kingdom. And when our life is aligned with the kingdom and we're sowing kingdom seeds into our inner life, then we're more likely to reap abundant life when we align ourselves with kingdom principles. I love the story of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verses 48 through 52. You remember this story. Jesus and his family has gone up to Jerusalem for the Pas Passover feast. Jesus is like 12. They go to the Passover feast and then they leave, but Jesus doesn't leave. He stays in the city. And it takes his parents like three days to find him. It says that, uh, you know, that they came. And, and when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they didn't understand that, the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them, and, and they came to Nazareth. And he went with them and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And then this part, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew and matured as a whole person. And we think about that, and we, there's a diagram that Dallas Willard has in his book, Renovation of the Heart, and it shows how he diagrams the soul. And we'll just take a look at this diagram. Um, I think it's in your notes, actually. But if you see, the outer circle of this diagram is the soul. That's the outer circle. And so, so what Willard believed was that the, the, your soul was all of the parts of your life. That's the essence of your life, all of the parts of it that encompassed your social activity, it encompassed your, your body, your physical person, uh, that's important, and your mind, and then your spirit, your heart, or your will, that, that, that inside. And, and so you can see the, the arrow coming in from the left side, word and spirit of Christ enters, and then evoking faith in Christ, which reestablishes communion with God, is coming out. So you notice that the, that the soul encompasses all of your life, the essence of who we are. Working from the inside out, we see our social life and physical life and intellectual life and spiritual life. And when, now let's tie that back to what Jesus answered when he was asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? You remember in Matthew chapter 22, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? He said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, 
with all of your soul, all, all of your life, and with your mind, with your strength. So far, there we go, yeah. All right, so let's pray. <laughs> uh, okay, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's all, all, of your, all of your person. And so we think of Jesus growing as a whole person. He grew in wisdom. That's the intellectual life. He grew in stature physical or bodily life. He grew in favor with God. That's our spiritual life. And with man, that's the social life. And so these are all topics that we're addressing in this series. We're zeroing in on today, growing in favor with God. And so how are the things in your life? Or or how are you doing lately? Do you feel like your life is in alignment? Or you you feel like you're growing in, in the things of the kingdom? Are you being attentive to what's going on? in the kingdom? Or is your life a bit off the rails? You feel like, ah, I'm not really tracking. Maybe I'm not spending a lot of time in the Word. I'm not spending a lot of time sowing seeds of the Spirit into my life. And it's just important for us to recognize that if we're not aligning ourselves with the kinds of practices that Jesus lived out his life with, then it's unlikely that we're going to live the kind of life that Jesus lived as we live into our places of influence. Jesus practice these certain things that, that shaped him. And it's kind of odd, isn't it, to think that Jesus grows. But, but growing in, in favor with God is growing in divine influence in your heart. Growing with fa- in favor with God is growing in divine influence in your life. When you look at the word favor, it's the Greek word which is also charis, and that's the word we get for grace. That's the word from which we get grace. And so Jesus continues to grow in grace. That's the context here. It's divine influence on the heart. And it's reflected then in the life of the person. Divine influence in your life is reflected as you live your life. And again, it's fascinating, maybe even a bit confusing when we realize that Jesus, who was God in the flesh, grows into maturity as the Father's divine influence grew in his life. I mean, Jesus is God, so to think of Jesus growing, that, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, but also to recognize that Jesus was fully human. And so he grows up in the same ways that we grow up as a human person. When we think about the kingdom of God, I want you to think about it as influence. The kingdom of God is wherever what God wants to be done is being done. So the parts of your life where you're living out what God's will is, then his kingdom is influencing you there. Kingdom is, is, is scope of influence. It's the realm of influence. And so when God's kingdom is taking over our life, there's more influence in our life. We're we're living a life that that looks more aligned with his life, with the life of Christ. And Jesus lived his life so that his his kingdom, so that the, the kingdom of God grew in him. And he matured, it tells us. And that was reflected in every aspect of Jesus' life. And it works the same way in our lives. It's a really dangerous thing for us to say, well, Jesus, Jesus could be like that because he was God. And here's why I think that's dangerous, because when we say that, we give ourselves a pass. We say, well, I can't really love everyone. Jesus could, but he was God. I can't really do that because I'm not God. Or, you know, Jesus was patient with people, but, you know, he was God. I can't be patient with people because I'm not God. And, and besides, you know, God doesn't, I mean, look at what I'm going through. But if, we, if we say, well, Jesus could be like that because he was God, then we give ourselves a pass from growing up into maturity and seeing the fruit of the Spirit grow in us. And, and while it's certainly true that we're not God in the flesh, as Jesus was, 
There's an expectation that if we live the sort of life that Jesus lived, then divine influence will grow in our lives as it did in his life. And it will flow out of us in kingdom-shaped behaviors and attitudes as it flowed out of his life. And so as grace or divine influence conforms us into the image of Christ, we reflect the kingdom of God more and more in every aspect of our lives, in our social relationships, in our bodily life, in our intellect, and in the, in the spirit, and the, and, the, and the fruit of the spirit that flows out of us. And so here's the question. What, what, what are we talking about? We talk about spiritual life. Well, we're really talking about everything. What, what's spiritual? Everything is spiritual. There's, there's nothing that's not spiritual. Like, our lives lived in Christ. That is it. We're, every place that our life touches, every, every way that our life flows is spiritual. We, we can separate, you know, say, well, that's secular, this is spiritual. But that's, that's a divide we've made. That's not one that God makes. So we, we make a bunch of categories. But how our life is lived out in every aspect, in our social life, our intellectual life, our physical life, it's all part of God's kingdom. And so we want to be attentive to that. And so if we get out of alignment with the kingdom, it's unlikely that we're really going to reflect the heart of Christ. And I have found myself in different places, in different times. And just recently, I said to Sharon, I just feel like I'm angry all the time, really fast. Like I, I, I've struggled with anger my whole life and I have a bit of a temper and, and, sometime, and, and often I'm able to manage that. And I've don't tend to yell at lots of people and that kind of thing. I don't push people around, but, but I can very, very quickly become angry. And I just have noticed that in myself lately. And I, I said, Sean, I don't actually know quite what's going on, but uh, you know, maybe it's, you know, so much, so, I'm in so much pain, honey. Sorry, it's my fault. You know, it's like, I, don't know, I can't get out of it. But I think actually what I, as I stop and take a, a step back, what I realize is I haven't been taking the time, I haven't been making the time to be quiet. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very routine in my morning devotions and all that kind of stuff, but, but when I find my life is just moving all the time and there's never a stop, I find that I start to, I start to, to weaken in, in that area. That, that filter starts to break down, and, and I find myself having more difficulty managing it. And again, mostly it's internal, and I just really I, I can kind of get that way. But part of it's just that I haven't been living in a good rhythm of taking time to breathe, taking time to be quiet. And so when our lives aren't aligned with kingdom principles and kingdom practices, the likelihood is that we begin to sort of digress. And so it's really important to pay attention to the practices that we're living in our life. And part of that is just recognizing that aligning our lives with the kingdom of God has to be the first priority. It has to be the first priority. If, if we want to live a life that's shaped by... if. And, 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 and where behaviors are flowing out that look like the kingdom, look like Jesus, we have to pay attention first to the kingdom. If we want to reap kingdom fruit, we have to sow kingdom seeds, and it has to happen routinely. That's got to be the first priority. And Jesus makes that clear in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. I'm going to, I'm going to read this out of the New Testament for Everyone, which is N.T. Wright's translation. N.T. Wright's a British theologian, and I, I, I enjoy his translation. But here's, what he's, here's how he translates this. So let me tell you, don't worry about your life, what to eat, what to drink. Don't worry about your body, what to wear. There's more to life than food. There's more to the body than a suit of clothes. Have a good look at the birds in the sky. They don't plant seeds. They don't bring in the harvest. They don't store things in barns. And your Father in heaven feeds them. Think how different you are to them. Can any of you add 15 inches to your height just by worrying about it? And why worry about what to wear? Take a tip from the lilies in the countryside. They don't work. They don't weave. But let me tell you, not even Solomon in all his finery was dressed as well as one of these. So if God gives that sort of clothing even to the grass in the field, which is here today, and on the bonfire tomorrow, isn't he going to clothe you too, you little faith lot? So don't worry about what, don't worry with your what do we eat and what do we drink and what do we wear. Those are the, all the kinds of things that the Gentiles fuss about, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Instead, make your top priority God's kingdom and his way of life, and all these things will be given to you as well. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow can worry about itself. One day's trouble at a time is quite enough. 
And then he has this little, has this little commentary on it. He writes this, Jesus had a strong, lively sense of the goodness of his Father, the creator of the world. His whole spirituality is many a mile from those teachers who insisted that the present world was a place of shadows and gloom and vanity, and that true philosophy consisted in escaping it and concentrating on the things of the mind. His teaching grew out of his own experience. When he told his followers not to worry about tomorrow, we must assume he led them by example. He wasn't always looking ahead anxiously, making the present moment count only because of what might come next. No. He seems to have had the skill of living totally in the present, giving attention, giving attention totally to the present task, celebrating the goodness of God here and now. It's, if that's not a recipe for happiness, I don't know what is. And he wanted his followers to do the same. When he urged them to make God their priority, it's important to realize which God he's talking about. He's not talking about a God who is distant from the world who doesn't care about beauty and life and food and clothes. He's talking about the Creator Himself who has filled the world with wonderful and mysterious things, full of beauty and energy and excitement, and who wants His human creatures above all to trust Him and love Him and receive their own beauty, energy, and excitement from Him. So when Jesus tells us not to worry about what to eat or drink or wear, He doesn't mean that those things don't matter. He doesn't mean that they, we should prefer, as some teachers have suggested, to eat and drink as little as possible and to wear the most ragged and disreputable clothes just to show that we despise such things. Far from it, Jesus liked to party as much as anyone. And when he died, the soldiers so admired his tunic that they threw dice for it rather than tearing it up. But the point was, again, priorities. Put the world first, and you'll, get its, and you'll find it gets moth-eaten in your hands. Put God first, and you'll get the world thrown in. And so as we enter into this year, I want to invite you to think about what are the areas of your life that need to be realigned with the kingdom of God as your first priority? What are the parts of the rhythm of life that you need to re-engage? Because when we align our lives with God's kingdom, it makes a difference. And we align our lives with God's kingdom by, practice, by practicing rhythms of grace. This is how we align our lives with God's kingdom. What I'm, what I'm talking about when I say rhythms of grace is essentially rules of life or spiritual disciplines. And so the question is, what spiritual disciplines are you going to continue to press into this year so that your life is lived in alignment with the kingdom of God? What are the ones you're currently practicing? What are the ones that you might need to add a little energy to in order to live this kingdom life? And so what is a rule of life? And we talk about it here once in a while, but it's been a little while, so it seems like it's good to revisit it. A rule of life in its simplest form is this, a rhythm of practices that empower us to live well and grow more like Jesus by helping us experience God in everything. That's a rule of life. That comes from Ken Shigematsu's book, God in My Everything. A rhythm of practices that empower uh, us to live well and grow more like Jesus by helping us experience every, God in everything. In his book, God in My Everything, How an Ancient Rhythm Helps Busy People Enjoy God, um, Ken Shigematsu writes this, the word rule actually comes from the Greek word trellis. And so a trellis is a support system, right? It's a support system for grapes. We, we have vineyards all over the Columbia Basin. A trellis is a support system for a vine or plants that enable them to grow upward and to bear fruit. So for a grapevine to produce good grapes, it needs support and, and, and it needs guidance in its growth or, or just it slumps to the ground. You lose a lot of the fruit. Grapevines in the wild will grow and they will produce grapes, but they'll grow on everything. They look for a trellis if there isn't one. They'll grow up a tree or even a rock. They'll use those things as trellises. It's a part of their nature to seek structure. And it's important to recognize that that's the kind of structure that we need in our lives as well. And so a rule of life is a structure that you build that brings you into contact with the Spirit of God who conforms us to the image of Christ and aligns us with the kingdom. I mean, just let's think about what some, what some of the spiritual disciplines are, some of the rhythms of grace. Um, here are the basic spiritual disciplines or rhythms of grace. These are detailed in Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline. He gives three categories. First, there's the inward disciplines. That's meditation. Psalm chapter 1, right? Blessed is the one who meditates day and night on the words. It's like a tree planted by streams of water. Meditation, prayer, fasting, study. These are the inward disciplines. Then the outward disciplines, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, then the corporate disciplines, confession, worship, guidance, celebration, 
Again, in the most simple form, we can work on a rule of life by deciding which of these rhythms we're going to practice daily and, and weekly, monthly, or yearly. What are the practices that you have in your life that you're incorporating? What are the inward practices? What are the outward practices? What are the corporate disciplines that you're incorporating into your life to align yourself with kingdom principles as a first priority? What I want you to notice is as you look at that list, every one of those things you would see in Jesus' life. We see all of those disciplines, all of those practices in Jesus' life. We know that Jesus spent time in meditation on the Word. We know Jesus spent time in prayer. We know Jesus fasted. We know that Jesus studied. He was well studied. We know that Jesus lived a life of simplicity. Jesus lived very much with solitude in mind. He was submissive. It says that, and he went home with his parents and was submissive to them. Like he practiced submission even to human people. He was a person of service. He practiced confession and worship and guidance and celebration. The first The first miracle takes place at a wedding celebration. So we know that Jesus incorporates all of these practices into his life. And so we want to practice them as well. We want to incorporate them into our life. You think about, well, what would a rule of life look like? I I try to break mine down this way. It's daily, it's weekly, it's monthly, and it's yearly. Like, what are the practices that I don't do everything every day? Right? So maybe, maybe you'd say, well, a daily practice would be study. I would spend some time in God's Word every day. That's study. Prayer, memorization. How are we doing with that? Are we spending any time in memorization? I think we shouldn't say, well, you know, I'm getting kind of old. I don't memorize as well as I used to. Well, you don't walk as well as you used to either, but you're still walking, right? (laughs) I mean, just, yeah, you might not be as good at it as you used to be, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. And I think, again, we give ourselves a pass. You know, I just don't, uh, you know, I should probably read a little bit more, but I don't really read. But you can read, right? You can read. So maybe you read slow. Well, read slow. You memorize slow. Okay, memorize slow, but don't not do it because, you know, you're finding it difficult. I would like to challenge you, especially if you're older. Some of you are much, much older than me. (laughs) Not very many of you, but, um, but it actually helps the brain. These are things that help us neurologically. Like, so just, just, just press in a little bit, but those are things that you could do daily. What about weekly? Well, maybe it's fasting one day a week. Worship, making Sunday morning worship a priority. Being a part of a community is really good, except as Brian said, if you're home today watching online, that might have been a good choice, especially for the early, early service. Study or fellowship, attend a small group. We have a men's group starting here this Tuesday night. That's been such a fantastic time, and here's how it looks for, for you guys. We spend a little bit of time teaching, and then we spend a lot, some time around the tables just having conversation about what we're teaching. So it's not just a lecture. It's, it's a teaching time that's also incorporated in having conversation and encouraging each other. And that, 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 the guys have found that so encouraging. I know it's going to take a little bit of time. But I want to encourage you to make that a priority. Make worship a priority with, with your family. Make a, a study, maybe a life group. Phil's got a table set up out in the foyer. I don't think you can miss it. It says life group. It's really big. You might want to think about a life group. Where are you connecting in life? Because if Sunday morning is your only connection, as delightful as it is, and we, I enjoy Sunday mornings a great deal, but this isn't the most relational time. This isn't the time that you get to interact with people as much. So where are you finding that? Maybe monthly, <laughs> excuse me, celebration fellowship. Attend or host one gathering for the purpose of just enjoying the company of others. Hospitality. Do you practice Hospitality. And I know it can be a challenge, right? It's like, well, you know, it's just so hard. We keep the house clean. And honestly, Sean and I are in a very different season of life right now. It's not that hard to keep the house clean. And I, I understand that. It was harder when our kids were younger. You know, it was one of those things, right, where you're just like, yeah, to get the kids to clean the house because somebody's coming over and then they open the door and the people are there and go, hey, so good to see you. Our house always looks like this. Maybe, maybe just let that go. Maybe just let it go. Just go, you know, we're going to have people over. And if you have people over who don't want to be at your house because it's a little bit messy, well, invite somebody else next time. <laughs> right? I mean, really and truly. Um, but, but where are those moments where you're celebrating with other people and telling stories and laughing? Laughter and eating together is just life-giving. Maybe one, one day a month, give, give time to uh, solitude and silence. Maybe your yearly practice would be to, to 
attend a conference or a camp or a marriage retreat or something? What's one thing a year that you're going to do that you're going away for? Maybe it would be practicing a, a, a silent retreat for two days. What, what could these practices look like in your life? We, we need these rhythms. And so the question this morning is what rhythms can you add to your routine in 2024? Maybe just pick one. Or maybe pick one in every category, an inward discipline, an outward discipline, and a corporate discipline. Maybe pick one and go, you know what, I'm going to be committed to this for 2024. And I think it's helpful for us sometimes to say that, uh, to say, you know what, I really, I'm going to make worship on Sunday morning a priority. And I'm not just going to make it a priority for a month. I'm going to make it my priority in 2024 to show up every Sunday I can. If I'm sick, I can't. Or if I'm out of town, I can't. But I'm going to make it a priority. And just see what, that, what kind of fruit that 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 yields. And so what's one of these rhythms that you can add to your life? I really resonate with Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. You've probably heard me quote this before, but, or you maybe have read it, but he says this. This is how he paraphrases it. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. You see, again, when I find myself at this place where every little thing that goes wrong causes me to just instantly be angry, most of the time, it's because I haven't given space to be with Jesus. That most of the time. And and, and the filters start to break down. Because all of these things that we plan into our lives, they're they're perishable. You know, they, they start to go away if we're not consistent. It's no different than playing my guitar. I don't play my guitar much anymore. And I'm beginning to feel it because I'm not very clear with it. I'm not very, I'm not very crisp with playing. And, and I, I've actually decided, you know, that I'm really going to start playing my guitar more as soon as I get out of the shoulder sling. And, and I'm really going to try to incorporate more rehearsal into my time because I actually really enjoy playing. But when you don't play all the time, pretty soon you notice, like, I've kind of forgotten those chords or, or I don't, my, my fingers don't automatically go there. The things that you train yourself to do, the things you do consistently make a difference. Going on in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I just love that phrase. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That's, That's where I got the idea of rhythms of grace from that text rather than rule of life. I, I, I like rule of life. That doesn't bother me at all, but I know that sometimes it's like, yeah, rules, you know, but, but what are the rhythms of grace? How can we place these rhythms of grace in our lives so that our lives are shaped more and more by divine influence into the image of Christ? And one of the really key principles is that we need to give more attention to training than to trying. I just want to put that out there. So there's a difference between trying and training. Trying is saying over and over again, I'm really going to get it this year. One of the reasons why we don't like New Year's resolutions, and I, and I get this, we say, we've done that before. We got to the first year, going to go, this year, I'm really going to do this, whatever this thing is, or I'm going to stop doing this, whatever this thing is. And two weeks into the new year, you're either doing it or you're not. Doing, you know what I mean? You just, that's what we say, I'm really going to get it this time, or tomorrow when I get up, I'm really going to do the thing, and I'm really going to try hard. I'm really going to get myself shaped up. And it doesn't happen that way. That's trying. We've done a lot of trying in our lives. Training is a different thing. Training is setting up deliberate patterns of behavior or habits that bring about change. That's what training is. As as you know, Sharon and I did the the Camino Way last summer. So in 12 days, we walked 192 miles and 25,000 feet of elevation. It It was grueling. But we, we started early, as early as the snow went away in the spring last year, walking. Every, every day that we could walk together, we walked together. We walked between 4 and 13 miles on our walks. Most of the time, it was between 4 and 6 miles. But we knew that if we didn't do that for the months leading up to that trip, we weren't going to be able to make it. They also, I did the Seattle to Portland bike race last year. I rode my bike. I, didn't, you, I couldn't believe how much time it took to train. You know how much just, just actual time it takes to walk four or six miles a day and then to ride uh, anywhere from 15 to 50 miles a day? It takes a lot of time. I realized that as I was doing that, I was like, I shouldn't have committed to these things because I don't actually have the physical time to get it all done. But I knew that if I wasn't riding every day, I was not going to make it. And I rode a lot and I still almost didn't make it. It was wickedly hard. 
But training allows you to do by default what you could never do by direct effort. Training allows you to do by default what you could never do by direct effort. And so if you want to realign your life with the kingdom, then it's going to mean training in the way that Jesus trained, through the disciplines he practiced routinely. We're created to be shaped into the image of Christ and aligned with God's kingdom as whole persons and children of God. That happens as we put ourselves into the path of oncoming grace. And we do that as we present ourselves to God in these rhythms of life. And we, 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 we experience more and more divine influence through these rhythms. Listen, this is a really important thing. If you don't hear anything, just hear this. Jesus didn't practice the disciplines. Jesus didn't practice these rhythms of grace. Jesus didn't practice a rule of life in order to gain God's favor or grace. He practiced the disciplines, the rhythms of grace, a rule of life, in order to bring himself further and further into the path of the divine influence. Jesus practiced these disciplines not to make God happy with him, not to please God. Jesus practiced these things because it brought him into the presence of grace. It put him in the path to oncoming grace. And it works the same for us. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians, that we, we come into the tent. We, we actually live in the Spirit, and we, we have it all the time, but, but we're being transformed bit by bit by bit as we put ourselves into the path of oncoming, oncoming grace. He tells the story about Moses, and when Moses would go into the tent, and he would come out of the tent, and his face was glowing. What was going on? He didn't transform his face, but when he got into God's presence, that transformed him. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about spirit. Uh, Rhythms of grace or spiritual disciplines. We're, we're just putting ourselves in the presence of God. We're not changing ourselves. God does that work. Thank, thank God for that. But when we practice these disciplines, these kingdom disciplines, we put ourselves in the path of oncoming grace. You can pick out some part of your life where you are routinely practicing particular things in order to accomplish something bigger down the road. Whether it's in your work, whether it's in your physical training, whether it's in your growing intellectually, whatever it is, you put practices in your life that help you grow in these things. And that's, that's, what, that's the way that God transforms us. We come into his presence in these practices. And divine influence brings about the abundant life that Christ wants us to have. You know, if I could go back to myself for just a second, you know, it's like Jesus doesn't want me every time something doesn't go just right to flare up. It's not good for me. My blood pressure goes up. My heart rate goes up. I might, I might not treat someone just right who's standing around me. That, that's, not, that's not abundance. That's not what he's after. That's not what he wants for me. And so the abundant life comes about as we put ourselves in the path of grace. I'm routinely drawn back to the words of St. Augustine from the Confessions where he wrote, Every man is in his way, a part of your creation, and longs to praise you. Even man who carries in himself his own mortality, that testimony of his sin, that testimony also that you resist the proud, for all that, man is part of your creation and longs to praise you. You stir us up to take delight in your praise, for you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. And we're not just talking, Augustine wasn't just talking about heaven. He's talking about the life that Jesus promises. We we can't rest until we find our rest in God. Jesus says, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you worn out? Come to me and find rest. The rest that Augustine speaks about is the, is the abundant life that Jesus tells us about. He says, I'm the door of the sheep. All, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy, but I've come that you might have a life and have it abundantly. That's the, that's the heart of Jesus for us. It is eternal life. It is that life will go on forever and we can be in the presence of God forever, but it's also abundant life here. The kind of life that spills out of us into all the places that our lives have influence and that, that hopefully causes people to go like, ah, I just, you know, let's talk about what, what, is, what do you have? What's in your life that that causes you not to be always angry, grumpy, or gives you, the, gives you the freedom and the energy to serve, to love other people, even if you're not being loved back. 
So what we're talking about in this series is sowing and reaping for 2024. The, the new year is a great time to reevaluate and to reconsider what you want your soul to be like, what you want to sow into your life. What are the seeds that you want to sow so that you reap something different at the end of the year? The life that Jesus lived and the rhythms that he practiced weren't to earn God's favor, but he practiced them in order to put himself into the path of oncoming grace. We can practice those rhythms in the same way, and in so doing, put ourselves into the path of oncoming grace and reap more of the abundant life that he desires for us. It's just so important to remember that we don't practice disciplines. We don't practice rhythms of grace. We don't practice a rule of life to earn God's favor. We practice them to bring us into contact with God's spirit. I remember listening to a, an interview that Dallas Willard gave and someone asked him this question, when are the spiritual disciplines unhelpful? And this was his answer, which revolutionized my way of thinking. He said, they become unhealthy when you feel when you feel like you've let God down if you don't do them. They become unhealthy when you feel guilty for not practicing them. Because the point is not how do we make God happy with us. The point is how do we bring ourselves into contact. That's the point of the disciplines. And so as we go into this year, as you go into this year, let me just invite you to think about what spiritual disciplines or rhythms of grace have you found most helpful in your journey with Christ? Which ones have been helpful in the past? And are you continuing with those? Why have you found them helpful? What is an area that you'd like to add some energy to in 2024? Again, maybe it's just one thing. Don't pick 10 things because that's just not helpful. It's like in your inward discipline, say, you know, I'd like to just learn a little bit more about prayer. I'd like to work on that a little bit this year. Okay, what's the practice that you'll do to, to do that? Or, you know what, we, we are going to work a little bit harder at hospitality this year. We're going to figure out how to do that a little bit better. We're going to have somebody over once a month. What's one thing that you can plug in there? What What's an area that you'd like to add some energy to? And then in seeking to change and grow spiritually, have you spent more energy on training or more energy on trying? I want to encourage you not to spend more energy on trying than you're spending on training. Put, put those practices in, and then you do have to, you know, put some energy. You have to try to keep up those practices, to be sure. So what's one or two areas you'd like to re-energize in 2024? To, to, to see the Spirit of God at work in your life, to put yourself in the path of oncoming grace. And then who are the people that you're going to walk with who will encourage you? Most of us, all of us, need that. That's why God's given us each other in a family like the church. Who are the people you're going to walk with as you live out this alignment with the kingdom of God in 2024? Always easier for me to go to the gym if I know someone's going to meet me there. Always easier to show up when I know if I don't show up, I'm going to be letting somebody down who's waiting for me. And so it's good to be with others as we practice these, these rhythms. As we go into this year, let's just, be, let's just add a little bit of energy. What's one, one area, two areas that you'd like to give some energy to this year so that you might be realigned with the kingdom of God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we thank you for the work that you're doing in us. And we know that we don't ch change ourselves. We don't reshape ourselves. We can, in some ways, work at things, but you're the one who's shaping us. You're the one who's changing us. I want to pray that you would help us to incorporate practices into our lives that bring us into the path of your divine influence so that you can shape and reorient our lives. God, we want to be aligned with your kingdom. We want to be people who reflect your image and your character. And so we just pray that, that you would help us to, to, to move into this, this year, reorienting ourselves around some practices that work to shape us. We thank you for the work that you're doing. We're not the same as we used to be. It's always changing, and that's a good thing. We want to pray that you would continue to walk with us and encourage us and that we would experience change as we live out these kingdom principles in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.